Okay, so today we're going to talk about introduction to pulse physiology. The important thing here is that, as we have said, if you know what is normal, you know that it is abnormal. and abnormal. Okay, but if you know what's normal, then you will know what is abnormal, right? So essentially, this is the reason why when we're dealing with anatomy and physiology, you always need to go back and review what is normal. Because if you know what is normal, then you can actually be able to know what is abnormal, right? So that's exactly what it is all about, okay? Now, um, very often in the past weeks, we talked about the different causes of a particular disease process. We always say etiology. That's why when you use the word etiology, and you're talking about classification, that's not the proper term, because the etiology has to do with the word. What's the key word there? Cause. The cause of the disease. When you're trying to describe the classification of bone fracture, that is not an etiology. Etiology has to do with what caused the break in the bone. It could probably be due to a trauma, an accident, you hit with a baseball bat and you have a skull fracture, or it could be something else, right? So what is the cause? So if I say in multiple sclerosis patients, what is the possible etiology? We said it is what? Autoimmune, right? Autoimmune diseases. Patients with rheumatoid arthritis, patients with SLE. So we want to know what caused the disease to occur. Now, if you do not know the cause of the term we use, idiopathic, right? Idiopathic means what? We do not know the cause. Many of the diseases we have, we do not know the cause. Now, iatrogenic is basically the result of an intended or unwarranted complication of a possible medical treatment. I'll give you an example. A patient had stomach ulcers. What did the doctor order? He ordered what? What did we learn? We insert what? A gastroscope, right? And a gastroscope is nothing else but a fiber optic cable inserted to the mouth, enters through the esophagus, goes to the stomach. What could be a possible complication there? Bleeding. Of course, if you hit that uh, scope can hit the ulcer, it could bleed. And what else? Can it be possible for it to perforate through the wall? And as you learn, the moment you perforate the wall, you have what? The acid in the stomach will go inside the peritoneal cavity. What do you develop? Peritonitis, okay? So, if I ask you a question on this, whether it's gonna be the exam or next week or not, when you have peritonitis, what are the most important signs and symptoms your patient would have? Number one would be what? It would be what? Okay, abdominal pain. What kind of pain? Localized or generalized? Generalized, generalized pain. Second would be what? Board-like rigidity. What do you mean by that? It means the abdominal wall becomes what? Rigid. Because of what? Peritonitis. The uh, peritoneal membrane will be inflamed, and therefore, as such, you end up developing what? Board-like rigidity, okay? Do you understand? So, these things, did you want this to happen? Was it intentional? No, it was not, right? So essentially what we're trying to do therefore is explain what happens there, okay? Now risk factors, we talked about heart diseases, right? So these heart diseases are able to what? We have to identify the risk factors because if you know the risk factors, then we can be able to what? Prevent the development of heart disease. Can you give me an example of a risk factor for heart disease? Atherosclerosis, what is the risk factor for that? Smoking. Hmm? Smoking. Well, smoking is one, but um, remember, hmm? risk factor would be <coughs> aside from smoking, what's the most common pathology in? Hypertension. This is like a review already, right? Hmm? Very good. So, what do you, is the risk factors? High fat in the blood, right? Hypercholesterolemia or hyperlipidemia. You understand what I'm saying? So you're taking an exam, whatever exam it is next week, you say, oh, every time you think of heart disease, you think of fat. The more fat you have, the more fat will develop where? Attached and it goes where? Into the coronary arteries, it blocks the flow of blood, okay? That's why it's called atherosclerosis. What is the name of that lesion that attach attaches to the wall of that? It's called the plaque, see? So whatever it is, is it the nursing exam? 
or a nursing licensure exam or a final exam, you have to know what I'm saying right now because it's a plaque. So what is the one that deposits on the wall of a tunica intima of an artery? It's called what? A plaque, okay? So pathogenesis on the other hand is defined as a development or evolution of the disease. That's the reason why when you make your presentations, you have to know what is the pathogenesis of the disease process. Because if you know the pathology and the pathogenesis, then it's easy to understand how to take care of these patients, right? Example, we talked about traumatic brain injury, okay? When you have a blood trauma to the head with a baseball bat, remember we said about cool versus country cool. What is cool? Cool means what? You hit with a baseball bat on the skull here, there's bleeding inside, right? The focal lesion on the side of the brain. And then what happens next? in the terms of pathogenesis. There's brain swelling, right? If it's just, just the coup, C-O-U-P, one part of the brain is affected in the pathogenesis. There's what? There's bleeding, there's what? Brain swelling, and what is going to happen? What's the next step? Aside from bleeding and it, um, swelling of the brain, you have what? Increase in what? Intracranial pressure. Okay? We know the skull is hard, the brain is soft. When the bleeding is there, in the blood occupies space, there is no room for expansion, the pressure goes up and up, and what do we do the next step? Brain herniation. And when the brain herniates, the medulla oblongata of the brain gets compressed, you end up, you stop breathing because that is the respiratory center. Okay? So just that's just one example. Okay? So what is the difference between a symptom and a sign? A sign is what? This is more objective. Sign. Which one more is subjective? Symptom. For example, in patients with arthritis, they come to you and say, hey, I have pain in my knee. What is that? Subjective or objective? Subjective. subjective because you cannot see the pain, you cannot feel the pain. On the other hand, if I come to you and say, hey, my pain is red, is that subjective or objective? Objective. That's the reason why Redness of the knee is an indication that there is what? Inflammation or swelling. That's why, why do you see it's objective? Because you see, you are the nurse, you see something that is red, then definitely that is considered what? A sign, something that is very objective because you can either what? See it and then what? Feel it. So example, if a patient says, hey, you know what, nurse, my knee is warm. Is that subjective or objective? Objective. Hmm? objective? objective, very good. Because you can be able to confirm if it's really warm or not, okay? Now, syndrome or syndrome is a set of signs and symptoms not yet determined to delineate what? And this is and occur together, okay? Which means that what? What does it mean? We do not know because we have a lot of signs and symptoms, we do not know whether it's a disease process itself, okay? Do you understand? Okay, now, therefore, remember the word Cushing syndrome? How many of you reported on Cushing syndromes? Okay, in Cushing syndrome, it's not the same thing as Cushing's disease, right? So you have all the manifestations of Cushing's, but you do not know what is causing it, right? Remember? What is Cushing's again? High levels of what? Corticosteroids. What are these corticosteroids that are high or elevated? Mineralocorticoid, which is the aldosterone, and what's the other one? Glucocorticoid, right? So if a patient has all these elevations of these hormones, what would you be the signs and symptoms? The sign, you see a patient who is what? What are the signs of a patient with Cushing's? Again, this is a review. Hmm? Okay, moon face, very good. You see the moon face? Oh, bang, that is already Cushing's syndrome. What else? Tractal obesity with purple spray, right? That could be a, a sign because you see it, you can confirm that, okay? So in other words, you are able to diagnose based on the appearance of the patient, but you're not sure if it's really Cushing's disease or not. Now, stages in clinical course, latent period, is very common among infections, you know? Between time between exposure to uh, tissue or injurious agent and first appearance of signs and symptoms, for example, if somebody gets sick in this room 
and he is inside the classroom if he does not want to miss the class, guess what? He's coughing and sneezing. Can we become affected, infected? Can there be transmission of the disease? Yes, it can, right? So it takes time for the appearance of the signs and symptoms. Like today, I'm okay. The following day, because one of my classes was sneezing, I developed what? Sneezing and coughing too. Did I get infected by the, the classmate that was sick last night yesterday? Definitely, okay? Prodromal period is time during which first signs and symptoms appear of the onset of disease occurs. And then, of course, as we said, refers to a period during which temporarily become mild or silent, okay? Now, subclinical stage, basically, when you look at the patient, they seem to be normal, because why? They, there are no signs and symptoms yet. Very often, we use the word acute versus chronic. Like, for example, we say chronic kidney disease. We talked about that, right? What happens in chronic kidney disease? Patients who have uremia, will they be able to develop erythropoietin? No, they don't. Remember the word erythropoietin? What is that uh, hormone for? Stimulates the red bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. So what would be a problem in patients with chronic kidney disease, like chronic clinical course? They develop what? Anemia. Anemia. Very good. So what do you think we give the patient? They lack erythropoietin. What do we give? The synthetic form of erythropoietin. Acute clinical course, course now. Some students do not understand what is the difference between acute and chronic. In most signature assignments, when I was looking at them, some people were talking about acute bronchitis when the topic was about what? Chronic. Is there a difference between the two? There is. So when your signature assignment, you talk about acute bronchitis, then you do not know, understand what the meaning of is what? Chronic bronchitis, right? Chronic bronchitis is seen in COPD patients. Remember what does COPD stand for? Chronic, chronic. chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic kidney disease. Chronic is a disease process that usually occurs in six months or more. It, they're dealing here with months, not days or weeks. That is like one or two weeks. Like if I say you have acute pneumonia, what does acute pneumonia mean? You have lung infection that just suddenly developed and therefore you are in acute pneumonia. Now, what about if I say acute MI? You just had suddenly had a heart attack, right? Okay. Remission. Now, in the case of MS, it was just lectured today. You know, there was no mention on this. Okay? And then for the important thing about what, what is the manifestation of MS? Dysfunction. Yes? Dysfunction. Huh? Cranial nerve dysfunction. Cranial dysfunction, what else? With regards to these two words. This is very typical. Again, for the purpose of the exam next week, we talked about this in terms of what can happen in multiple sclerosis patients? There you go. See, if you don't pay attention now, it's up to you, okay? It, it's really up to you. If you just wanna go to sleep and look at your Facebook account, that's fine. But uh, patients with MS, there is periods of what? There you go. Remission and exacerbation. What does that simply mean? It means that there are weeks when they're fine, no signs or symptoms, and there are weeks when they have what? Exacerbation. You have to know what these words mean. One time, one student was raising their hand and asking me, Dr. Gamma, what does exacerbation mean? I told her, it's part of the exam. That means, what is exacerbation? Increase in the severity of the signs and symptoms. As you have mentioned, patients with MS, they have what? They can either have hemiparesis or hemiplegia, or if it involves spinal cord, you have what? Quadriplegia or Paraplegia. Do you understand? So, the paraplegia is that a sign or a symptom? Sign. Sign, because you can see, he can't walk, he can't move his legs, his arms. If it's quadriplegia, it's paraplegia, they can't move the legs. It's a sign. Right? On the other hand, if I say there is numbness, is that a sign or a symptom? It's a symptom because I cannot feel the numbness with this patient. Do you understand? It's going back. So we have been able to expo uh, discuss a lot of clinical conditions here, but the first week is important because of that, you know? Convalescence is stage of recovery, plain and simple, but you've got getting recovery, okay? And then secondly, pathologic condition after an acute illness. Example, I suffered a stroke. Who spoke to discuss on strokes? What could happen in a stroke patient? What could be considered a sequelae there? Yes? 
when you're paralyzed on one side of the body, will you be able to move the joints? So what do you think will happen? What we consider the sequelae? Hmm? Yes? Of course, you have a joint contracture. Very good. What's a contracture? Stiffness of the joint because you're not being able to move the joint. That becomes a sequelae, which simply means that to pre prevent this from happening, you have to what? Do what? Range of motion exercises as part of nursing intervention, right? If you don't, have you ever seen this patient with stroke? They, what? they walk like this, right? And the shoulder is not being moved, guess what happens? The shoulder becomes stiff. It's an example of a sequelae. A subsequent pathologic consult, uh, condition after an acute illness. He suffered a stroke, he can't move his arm, he can't move his leg, hip, knee. It became stiff. It's called joint contracture. Contracture means shortening of the muscles and the ligaments. It will be difficult to move. How do you prevent that? Immediately doing what? Range of motion exercises. Okay? Uh, normality in health and disease, you have all these normal values, like normal values of blood pressure, normal values of sodium, potassium, and all these. And then what happens in, in the disease process? Normality and um, the, the, the important thing here too is that we use statistics, data, statistical data and certain tests based on the bell-shaped curve, based on how is the number of people getting sick. The definition of the word reliability, what do you mean by that? The test is able to give the same results in repeated measurements. What do I mean by that? In the case of a fracture, for example, you want a test that is reliable. What test do you suggest that we do? Fracture. Patient fell. I mean, you look at, examine the leg, you can see a bony deformity. The leg is no longer straight, like in the tibia. What is the test that Dr. Gamo will tell the nurse to do? Yes? Of course, an ordinary x-ray. So if I take an x-ray now at 6 in the morning, and I take an x-ray at 7 in the morning, will it give me the same result? Yeah. Of course. That's the reason why in fractures we need to do an x-ray. Because why? We want to know whether what part of the bones are broken. Right? You talk about different types of fractures, we need to know the types of fractures, right? Is it transverse fracture? Is it spiral structure? All the okay, spiral fractures, okay? Now, these are two important words, validity is, do you want not, you don't just want the test to be reliable, but it has to be valid. And of course, the degree to which a measurement reflects the true value of what it tends to measure. So example, you have a breast mass, I want to do a biopsy. What's the purpose of doing that? To differentiate what? Benign from what? Malignant, okay? If it's benign, good. If it's malignant, it's cancer, definitely, okay? and predictive value extent to which a test can differentiate between presence or absence of a person's condition. Example, the patient went to the emergency room, okay, with difficulty of breathing, okay? He has high-grade fever, with productive cough of yellow-green phlegm, okay? What test do I want to do to determine whether this patient has, what do you think is this patient suffering from? He has difficulty of breathing, he has one week, productive cough of yellow green phlegm. What would what test would you recommend? Hmm? What first of all first of all, what organ of the body is affected here? The lung. The lung. So what test would I do for this patient to determine whether the problem is in the lung or not? Hmm? Before I do the sputum culture. Well the sputum culture is very good, yes? Huh? What? Bond? Now, why did you think of bond? Bond is done for renal failure, remember? Has nothing to do with what I've just said, okay? In patients with lung infection, remember? I'm coughing. I have productive cough of yellow green phlegm. I have fever of a one week duration. I will not do a bond. I will probably do it later, right? There's nothing, I have not said anything about the kidney function yet, right? Again, very basic things. What do you think should I do first? Of course, it's just x-ray, my goodness. Okay. Just x-ray. 
Is that what Dr. Agamo will order in the chart for this patient? Yes. So expect questions like that in an, an exam next week, right? You want to know what would the doctor order? Most of the questions will be in the form of a case scenario, okay? So I'm still trying to make sure the questions will be easy and challenging too, okay? So example, if I say a patient was brought in the emergency room with difficulty of breathing, with high grade fever, what would I recommend? I want to do a chest x-ray. Why? Because I want to know whether the patient has pneumonia or not. Will I be able to see pneumonia on an x-ray of a patient? Yes. Yes, because I would see the pneumonic infiltrates consistent with pneumonia. Okay? But I want the next step would be what? I want to know what kind of pneumonia are we dealing here with? Is it viral or bacterial? So what do you think is the other diagnostic test that I will do that will tell me what is causing the etiology of this pneumonia? Or the cause? Is it bacterial or viral? What is the next important step? The best for infection? Sputum what? Definitely. Sputum culture and sensitivity testing. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. So we want a test that is what? Both reliable and valid. Okay, whatever it is. It's usually in cancer, it has to be a biopsy. In infection, it has to be what? A culture and sensitivity testing. Pneumonia, what specimen are we going to use? Sputum, CS, or culture and sensitivity testing. What about diarrhea? Stool, culture and sensitivity testing. Okay? In other words, you would be able to see the same organism in that culture if it's the same organism causing the infection. Okay. Now these two concepts are very important too. Sensitivity is a test that will be positive when applied to a person with a particular condition. In other words, when I do this test, if it turns out to be positive, you really have the disease process itself. It is a test for true positives. What about specificity? Probability that the test will be negative when applied to a person without a particular condition. In other words, it is a test for what? True negatives, okay? Remember that. So example here, in this particular uh, slide here, we have talked about diabetes, already, right? so let's use that as an example. Let's say out of 100 patients, you have a total of 100 patients. So if I come up with something like this, a diabetic patient there are 30 with diabetes. How many do not have diabetes? So you add 30 plus 70, what do you have? 100, okay, of course. So how many have diabetes? 30. How many do not have diabetes? Okay. So now we're coming up with a new test. Now remember, we talked about diabetes before. How do you establish a patient to have diabetes? Blood sugar. You have FBS, what else? Hmm? Okay, it's B1, AC, but it's for every for three months duration, what else? So I want you to study about diabetes. Remember, in the in the need, it's not just ordinary diabetes. That's the reason why when you give, give a list of topics, everything about diabetes. What are the diagnostic tests about diabetes? It's not just gonna be fasting blood sugar or HB1 AC. What else? I, have you studied for the exam? I hope, right? You have only one week. In diabetic patients, you do other tests, right? Oral glucose tolerance tests. Make sure you know what is oral glucose tolerance test, OGTT. What is FBS test? I hope you're taking down notes. It's up to you if you don't want to, okay? These tests are done to confirm whether you have diabetes or not. Now, <coughs> what happens if you come up with a new test? Now, this new test is designed to find out whether they have diabetes or not. So let's say this test is not FBS, it's not OGTT, but a different test. It's not HB1AC, but it's, let's say let's call it the West Coast test, West Coast. Now this test was done on how many people? 100. At the onset, you already know that there are how many have the disease of diabetes? 30, how many do not have diabetes? 70. So this new test, it's not FBS, it's not OGTT, but rather it's called what? West Coast test. When we did the test on these individuals, we found out out of the 30, how many are positive for that particular test? 20, how many did not have come up with a negative value? 10. So 20 plus 10 is 30. So this is considered what? 
true positive. Why true positive? There were 30 with the disease. Out of the 30, this West Coast test gave me what? 20 positive result. That's true positive. On the other hand, those without diabetes, we did the test. Some of them have a positive test. What do you call that? False positive. False positive because they do not actually have the test. Or they do not have the disease. They do not have diabetes. What about the ones that are negative for this test? 37. So what do you call this kind of result? True negative. True negative. Okay? So in other words, if you add this with this, you end up with 70 people which have, do not have the disease. So which one is the test for true positive? Sensitivity. Which one is a test for specificity? True, true negative. negative. Be aware of that. Okay? Now, again, you can see here other factors that will affect the disease process in all the conditions we have discussed so far. Cultural considerations, age and biological factors linked. Like in elderly patients, they're at risk of what? Hypertension. What else? Atherosclerosis. Right? What else? Now notice every time you talk about in anatomy, they always talk about what happens when you get older. Okay? You end up with all the disease process, right? And of course, age will also be one factor there. Gender differences. So, let's talk about that. Which, can you give me any clinical condition which affects mostly females more than males? Breast cancer. Hmm? Breast cancer. Well, obviously breast cancer in women, <laughs> that's quite well, true, but what else? You talked about this today. Stroke. Hmm? MS. What did you say? MS. Multiple, of course, very good. That's already very good, huh? <laughs> women are more affected in MS, right? Like a stroke patient, is there any significant difference? No, both men and women will be affected. MS, SLE, which is an example of autoimmune disorders, usually affects what? More women than men. Is that something to consider? Of course. In autoimmune diseases, who gets more affected? Women, more than men. Systemic lupus, MS, rheumatoid arthritis. Remember that. Of course, situational differences and time variations. We know about the effect of the circadian rhythm on the body. Now, what is the study of the patterns of disease involving population is called what? Epidemiology. It comes from the word epi, which is upon, demo means people, ology means study. What is upon the people? What are they sick of? Okay? So these are three words that I want you to remember. Endemic, native to a local region. For example, do we have malaria here in California? No, we don't. Why? Because we do not have that mosquito that transmits what? Malaria. Do we find malaria in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines? Yes, we do. What about South America? Yes, we do, because we have a lot of bodies of water and big trees where the mosquito will thrive. That's the reason why we have malaria there. Here, we do not have that. But here, what do we have here as an endemic disease? West Nile virus. And why is that dangerous? Meningitis and encephalitis, okay? Epidemic spread to many people at the same time. It involves a lot of people, very explosive. And pandemic, OMG, it affects everybody. Different region, different countries. The best example here was the what? The SARS virus, remember in the, I don't know if you're, you were probably still in high school or what. In 2002 and three, there was this epidemic that started where it became a pandemic in China and then the virus spread to Hong Kong, and then that time, people were trying to migrate to Canada and the US. I remember when you go to the airport, everybody was wearing what? A face mask. All the passengers, because why? Spread to a large geographical area from Asia to the mainland US and Canada. A lot of people got infected, okay? So endemic is important, epidemic and pandemic. Now, other factors of disease, age, ethnic group, gender, again, very important consideration. Levels of prevention. This is one thing that you have to know. How do you prevent a disease from occurring? Primary, you alter what? The susceptibility. Can anybody give me an example of these? Hmm? Immunization. Very good. Immunization or vaccination, right? So, for example, in cervical cancer, can we do vaccination for HPV or human papilloma virus? Yes, we do, right? So again, what about for you, uh, when you start working? Remember there was in the topic on hepatitis, can you become vaccinated for hepatitis? 
Remember, there are how many types of hepatitis we discussed in the class? Okay, three, then you were not here. There were <laughs> five, okay? So which one is fecal oral contamination? A. A and what? E. Okay, you will pass the exam next week, okay? What about B, C, and D? How are they transmitted? Change of body fluids, intravenous medications, drug addicts who use different kinds of needles. It therefore is a means upon which blood transfusion and chain of sex, right? So obviously, how do you reduce abstinence or safe sex, right? Or as you said, vaccination for those people, especially you. When you start working in the hospital, should you be vaccinated for hepatitis? Yes. You should or else you end up with the risk. Now remember as nurses, there is the risk of getting what? Oh, oh my God, that's the worst thing that can happen. An HIV patient, a hepatitis patient, you could end up getting the infection because of a needle, okay? That's why when you discard of all the needles that you use, you have to put them in the containers, okay, the shops containers. Secondary, early detection, screening, and management of disease. For example, yes. patients with cervical cancer, we do what? Yes. What do we recommend? Pop smears, very good. Remember pop smears? We talked about this, pop smears. Uh, what about women with breast cancer? Mammograms, very good. What about men? Digital rectal exam, plus of course, what do we check? Prostate specific antigen, right? Tertiary is rehab, supportive care, reducing the disability, right? If you remember, I think there was one time here where I talked about what? In stroke patients, right? What, what do you do with stroke patients? They're paralyzed on half of the body, like this, okay? What is the rehabilitation for that? You do gay training, okay? In a situation like this, what kind of device would you use for rehabilitation? I paralyze on the left side. What do I recommend? A pair of crutches, a walker, or a cane? Which one would you choose? Walker. So I have a walker here. How many legs does a walker have? Four. So I paralyze on the left side. For you to use the walker, how many hands do I need? One or two? Huh? So can I use a walker? I go like this? <laughs> the answer is wrong. And that is how you fail a nursing exam. So what should I use? A pair of crutches? What has one side of paralyzed? I can't. That's what you call critical thinking here. See? We talked about strokes today, right? But remember, when I told you to study about stroke, it means what? Study everything about strokes. So what would you recommend? Oh, yeah? Hmm? Why cane? Because the person only has one hand and So if I'm paralyzed on the left side, Maria, where will you let me hold the cane? Right. On the right hand. Now where will you stay as a nurse? The left side. The weak side or the strong side? The weak side. Why would you stay on my weak side, Maria? Why? Just in case you can't like tip over And you can what? Of course, that's good common sense thinking. You will pass the nursing exam next week and the following weeks, okay? Because you're using your head. A nurse must be able to have critical thinking skills. A patient is part, we talked about strokes today, right? A patient suffers from a stroke, you give the cane what? Right side or left side? Right side, because that's a strong side. That's the only side that can hold the cane. What kind of cane would I use? Quad cane or single tip cane? Quad, quad cane. Why? Because it has four little uh, legs and therefore? Better balance. Better support, right? Better support. Very good, okay? So rehabilitation, you want to let them walk again. You do physical <coughs> therapy, you do OT. OT, occupational therapy, is for activities of daily living, feeding. There was mention of that today, right? I, I am paralyzed on the left, I have choice to use my right. Now, can I eat with one hand? So you have to modify what? The, the plate. There's a guard plate. So every time I go like this, the guard plate will prevent the rice to spill on the table the guard plate in the plate, okay? So that is what happens in levels of prevention, okay?